What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the Struggle to Strength podcast, your source for real life application on how to turn your struggles into strengths in all things mind, muscle, and money. <laughs> all right. Welcome to the Struggle to Strength podcast with Justin Wren. Hey, thank you. New intro. <laughs> well, man, I'm super excited to have you here. Thank this you. Is, this is awesome. Guys, this is Justin Wren that we have on the podcast today. He was gracious enough to bring us on his last night. So this is a sort of like a part two conversation. Yeah. And I'm excited to have it. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I thank you for welcoming me into your home. <laughs> and welcome to Austin. Thank you. And so, yeah. Thank I appreciate you so it. much. Am I the first podcast? In, in this, this room? In this room? Yeah, you are. Wow. Ever. Yeah. Your first ever. ever. Yeah, it might be the only ever, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm honored. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for coming. And, and you do so many things. How do you introduce yourself? Like if we were to introduce you, like what's yeah, your, what's your title? Question. What's your job title? Uh, yeah, we were, we yeah. talked yesterday about like, what do you do? This yeah. is like a, what do you do? Who are you kind of situation? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I think, I think for me, I, I don't know. I'm just a dude that tries to put love and compassion in action. And, and I want to fight for people. And so I do that through different, different ways or modalities or, or opportunities. And so I started a nonprofit. That's what I'm most passionate about is the, the good work we get to do in the world to equip people with practical, tangible tools um, to change their lives and educate them with the knowledge to do that. And then they, hopefully they're empowered to take it on for themselves and to be the change in their own community. And we do that for the most oppressed people group um, in the world, according to anthropologists, the, the pygmy people in, in Africa, which uh, we're in Congo and Uganda. We're thinking about expanding to Rwanda and Burundi. There's eight or nine African nations that, um, that they live in. And one day we want to be there with community development for, for all of them, where it's starting by getting them land that they own. They're the first people group of Africa. Like they should have actually some land ownership. And yet in their countries, almost all of them don't have any. It's all been taken from them. And so then giving them, uh, yeah, drilling wells, helping them drill wells for themselves. So uh, getting clean water. Um, we've seen 1,651 people transition out of slavery and into freedom. And that's through the nonprofit Fight for the Forgotten. Wow. Yeah, that's that's probably been the most rewarding. Gotten over 50,000 people clean water. Um, and now we're getting ready to build a hospital and a school. We Last year we built... Uh, 28 homes, it's going to be 32 homes this year. And uh, they're part of learning how to build those homes for themselves. So sustainable farms. Um, and then stateside, we do bullying and suicide prevention. We've been in over 100 schools, over 100 martial arts academies. Um, we're about to have a free program that goes out to anyone at any martial arts academy or any school that wants a 12-week curriculum where they can take people through it. And it's it's character development, but basically the premise of it, it's called, or the title is Heroes in Waiting. My whole thing is that anyone um, can can be a hero and that it, and kind of almost trying to take away like this magical or out of reach, you know, thing about the word. And it's like, no, a hero is simply just someone who sees a need and takes action. Um, it's not someone with supernatural powers or superhuman strength or, you know, for kids, it's not some guy with a cape on TV. It's like, no, it's someone that sees a need, takes action and like does something to help somebody. And so, um, and sometimes that takes, you know, the five seconds of courage or 10 seconds of courage. So, but I guess to explain some of the things, my background, I've, I've uh, been a professional fighter for 15 years. Um, since I was 19 years old, I'm actually 35. So I guess 16 years now, my career's expanded across that long. And before that, I was a wrestler. I won 10 state championships here in Texas and um, five-time All-American, high school national champ, and then a, a Greco-Roman national champ, lived at the Olympic Training Center, was the youngest heavyweight in the UFC on the Ultimate Fighter TV show. Um, I fight for Bellator MMA now. I'm on a six-fight win streak. I got to write a book called uh, Fight fight for the forgotten same title as, as the, the name of the nonprofit. And, and now I get to speak and share my story like all around the world, which is pretty nuts and bonkers. I grew up with a speech therapist from kindergarten to sixth grade and was petrified, terrified to, to speak in front of any audience. And I, I, in fact, I turned down the first nine opportunities that were paid wow. and my agents like, look, you stepped away from fighting cause you're trying to get your life right from addiction. 
and people are trying to pay you now and not even to fight to like speak and share your story. And I'm like, okay, but I, I'm a fighter, not a speaker. I don't have the ability to do that. And he's like, well, I, I don't even know if it's about the ability, man. You don't have the availability to do it. You <laughs> won't do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Um, and yeah, now I've gotten to do a, a, a Ted talk back in the day and, um, you know, speak in at a castle in Edinburgh, Scotland and, uh, at Warwick University in the UK and all, all over the US. And it's been, it's been really neat. Some of my most fun time speaking are whether it's in schools, even prisons, but um, for like Oklahoma DHS, like all their frontline workers that take care of like the foster care kids and the uh, mentally disabled and uh, the elderly and loving on them, but getting to go to the children's hospitals and, and different or the the boys and girls homes and things like that. And so it's been fun. It's, it, it's, I guess that's a really long intro to what I do or who I am, but it, I just want to, I just want to put love and compassion in action, whichever, whichever way I can. And uh, yeah, now I, now I have a podcast called overcome that you guys were on and I'm, uh, yeah. I'm really excited about that. So yeah, I hope that becomes one of the most meaningful podcasts in the world that helps people like change their lives so they can make the world better. I mean, the premise of it in, in, in the first place is, in, it's good you know you have a good premise you do good things you're a very well-rounded human you, know? you like have a lot of you have a lot of things that you do uh to help the world i was i was curious when we were we were talking about this last night you have your hands in so many different pots you know and a lot of it is based on the premise of just doing good in the world how like how were you drawn to these different avenues of helping people the pygmies kids bullying and and things of that nature. Like what drove you to specifically help the world in that way? Yeah, we, we talked about it a little bit yesterday on, on the show where, you know, as you advance through life, like things just kind of compile yeah. or build up and like things happen and come into your life. And, um, so I don't say no a lot. I do say no a lot more now, um, so that I can stay focused on, on what I, I want to do and how I, can have the most impact. So I do say no, but at first it was, I mean, I, I got my hand raised. I don't know if it was like 12, 10, 12, 13 times, um, at the beginning of my career. And I would just, I don't think there's one picture of me smiling from any of those fights. Mm -hmm. And I get my hand raised and I think literally in the, while people are cheering, sometimes people chanting my name or something like that, like my hands up, my team's smiling, my family's smiling, and I'm thinking in my head, like, is this it? Is this, wow. all, is this all? <laughs> you know, like, there's got to be something more. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't have that there's got to be something more at the beginning. I was just like, man, why doesn't this fulfill me? Why doesn't this? Uh, and so I was struggling with addiction after a, a elbow surgery. Got put on Oxy for four months straight before I had surgery. Um, because I had to argue with, uh, the insurance company had to petition or appeal and finally have their doctor that they authorized for my surgery, who was an ankle and knee doctor who did a couple of elbow surgeries a year. I'm living at the Olympic training center. I'm representing the United States. I'm yeah, this I'm should be top trying to, priority. yeah, I'm trying to get ready for professional sports and they're trying to send me to like a lower level doctor that doesn't work on elite athletes who's saying, I don't want to do the surgery and I won't. Um, but they, they kept saying, you can't go to this doctor. You can't go to that doctor. You can't go to this doctor. And I was like, this is crazy. So the only thing those doctors had to do and before they knew about the opioid epidemic was they're putting me on the strongest oxy oh, um, because I had broken my elbow, dislocated my elbow, had completely severed the ulnar collateral ligament, which would not heal without surgery. I don't even have that ligament anymore. Sure. They had to take a tendon out of my hamstring, put it in my elbow uh, to replace a ligament, which they said was a good thing, a tendon stronger than a ligament. So they said it'd be like I'm, and it's from my leg. So they said it's like I'm kicking someone in the face when I punch them. <laughs> but, uh, so it worked out. But the thing that was so tough was, I mean, it was a, if you take Oxycontin for eight, nine days, you're, you're going to be hooked, yeah. um, at least chemically. But I had that addict mind as well that I discovered then. And so I, 
I needed it. I wanted it. My body said I had to have it and literally prioritized it for, for survival. Like said, this is more important than food and water. And so that was a struggle. And when I got out of that for a season, it was because I wanted to live a life of service going from fighting against people to fighting for people. And then it was shotgunned. It wasn't focused. It was, I'm going to go to night school, volunteer at the Denver Children's Hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to start bringing in the same guys that kicked me off the team at Grudge that I was telling you guys about last night, some of, the, some of my heroes, some of the guys that were posters on my walls as a kid um, I, I, that I really looked up to kicked me off the fight team because my drug problem got so bad. And then six months later, nine months later, I'm... I'm a volunteer and I'm loving it on the oncology unit with the kids with cancer that are bigger, better, stronger fighters than I had ever been. Like they're teaching me incredible life lessons. And then I'm able to introduce the guys to this. And there's these guys with UFC championship belts and they're coming in and meeting these kids and, and they're, they're holding it strong and these kids are taking pictures with them or they're sitting down and playing the UFC video game <laughs> uh, and the kids playing as, as the guy sitting right next to him, yeah. right? Or, or he's playing as himself and getting his butt kicked by, by this little kid. And um, then they have to walk outside and literally just cry because they're like, wow, I didn't like this. This is the battle. This, I thought my life was tough or I thought what I was going through was hard and seeing a four-year-old or a nine-year-old. And so that, that was what kind of started the journey, the children's hospital. Then it was the rescue mission in Denver and with uh, the homeless. And then it was like an inner city youth group uh, or at risk youth group. And then um, I was like doing that for a year, but I'd stopped fighting. I was saying no to speaking engagements because I didn't think I could do that. And I had some appearances, um, some like seminars that I could do where I'm on the mats teaching some people some stuff, but Dude, I had eviction notices. I had, like, it was it was a hard, hard, hard year financially. And being stressed about that, but just also knowing, like, you know, this is going to work out. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm not concerned about me and I'm, I mean, you have to be concerned about you too, to a certain extent. And now it's, like, probably the most important thing to me, self-care, before I can take care of others. But at that stage, it was like, I'm just going to help people and everything's going to work out. But it was a little shotgunned and I was like, I need direction. I need like a real focus. And, um, yeah, so it's just crazy how you, you just, I think, I think I told someone just a few days ago, they're like, how do you get started? I was like, just start small, just start with something. Like I never thought I was going to do anything overseas. I was just in Denver living there and just started locally. And if you start small, it'll start to grow. And you just have your head on a swivel, looking to make a difference somewhere for someone. Because I really believe every every dark nook and cranny on planet Earth, and there's a lot of them, you know, needs a whole lot of light and a whole lot of love. And we can we can be part of ushering that in. And so, um, yeah, it's just been it's been wild to see all the things that have happened and built up so that it can be more focused now. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people they are often afraid to start because they think like, well, I don't, I don't know exactly what I want to do. You know, like I, there's, there's definitely a big element of, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't want to look stupid, but it's also, I know that's always been my main problem is like, I just don't know what to do. I'm like, I believe in myself and I know that if I really go hard after something that, um, you know, I can do it, but it's like, I don't know what to do. And I think one of the things that is so awesome that I've learned from this podcast, and I hope our listeners can learn too, is like a lot of successful people, like didn't know what to do. They, you know what I mean? They, like most people um, that we've talked to that are successful have done so many different things. So many things that are like unrelated, maybe even to like what they're doing now. Um, And I think one of the things that kind of, you know, leads to success is being okay with that and understanding that like none of that stuff is wasted time, you know, that like to find something often you have to kind of search around in a lot of different places and do a lot of different stuff. And, you know, you're not like wasting your time by trying something that maybe it's not, you know, I don't know what it is like 60% of people who get a college degree, they don't end up working in that degree, you know, 
like maybe you go to college, you get a degree and then you become a successful entrepreneur. You didn't have to go to college, but like that stuff's not, that's just part of the journey of life. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And, and you guys were saying the word well-rounded and as a mixed martial artist now, if you're not well-rounded, um, it's very hard to, uh, to get to the top and stay at the top or be in the break into the top 10 because you'll be exposed for not, you know, only being one-sided. Right. At the same time, there's guys that do just absolutely win the world championship because they're a master at one thing. And I've, you know, there's a great book I, I hear called The One Thing. You know, what's the one thing you're going to yeah. do? And That's stay a great focused book. on Cal that. Newport, just, right? yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. And I think it's, it's like, just do one thing. But I, I, that hasn't been my story. And um, I guess, I guess now it's just trying to, yeah, how do we, I've already said it, but how do we put love and compassion in action? If it's going to do that one thing, then I'm for it. Yeah. And well, that's kind of your one yeah, thing then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's different, many different ways for it to happen. But I remember that I was just a fighter and people told me that I told myself that I doubted me. People doubted me, um, saying, Oh, what are you going to do? Like, uh, about going over to, to Africa, living there and trying to teach them. I didn't know how to drill water wells, um, but it came out of a, a point of pain and grief and, and just knowing like I can go to the toilet and use the restroom and clean water. I can give my dog clean water. I can water the grass with clean water. So every human being on earth should have clean water. And so I could at least learn how to start the process and teach it to somebody else and then they can make it their own and keep going with it. But anyways, I, I was going over there and there's people from the humanitarian world and missionary world and other things. And they're like, well, what group are you with? What organization are you with? And then when I would talk to them, they're like, you need three or four years of training. You need to go to school. You need to do this. You need to do that. And you cannot go there solo. You have to be like f flying a flag of somebody's like banner saying I'm with these people or else you won't get anywhere. You won't be able to do anything. No one will trust you. Like you'll have no, uh, credibility, all that stuff. And I was just like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. I met these people. I love them. They've adopted me in and like, we're just going to go for it. And so it's, it's been a beautiful process where there wasn't as much red tape and there wasn't as much, uh, bureaucracy and there wasn't as much, at least, unneeded there is there with the government officials and things like that sometimes, but like, we're not adding to that, you know? And, um, so I think we're a smaller, leaner, more agile, mobile, flexible nonprofit that can say, ah, oh, well, yo, I've been told many times you just need to do clean water. Stop talking about agriculture or starting to learn how to build homes or, or doing any of this. And now some of these bigger nonprofits that I absolutely love, Project Cure out of, out of uh, Denver, mm -hmm. they're probably the best nonprofit for medical supplies in the entire world. 138 countries, their founder inspired me to start Fight for the Forgotten. And he was the one guy that said, hey man, I was an economist and I wrote books that are still at universities for people to learn about the economy. And then I went to Brazil and I helped uh, the president of Brazil turn around. This was in the eighties, like turn around uh, their bankruptcy. Uh, the whole country was bankrupt and he helped them with that. But while he was there, a doctor said, Hey, you're helping us with this, but let me show you what you could really help us with. Took him to the favelas. He went into a little clinic he saw the, the AIDS epidemic and they're literally taking bandages off of like older people, throwing them over a clothesline that are bloody. And then here's a kid that has a fresh injury, um, got in an accident. I think it was a bike accident or something like that. And they're grabbing off those clotheslines, bloody bandages, oh like God. ACE bandages and putting it on this child. No and the doctor's like, he was like one of the head doctors in Brazil. He's like, I get that we need this, but we need medical supplies. We're just, we don't have anything in our country. And this is why kids are getting AIDS. So Dr. James Jackson came back and he was like, Hey, I'm going to start going to Denver hospitals. And I'm going to say, Hey, can you guys donate some American medical supplies and us take it down there? His first donation to Brazil was 250,000. Now he's in 138 countries a year. Wow. And the minimum they take is two shipping containers of at least $250,000 of medical supplies. 
So they're partnering with us. They've donated 1.5 million in medical supplies for our hospital. We just have to raise the money to build the hospital. And it's like, wow. You know, he was like, Hey, don't let people limit you. People told me how he's doctor, but he's like a doctor, uh, I think a PhD and like uh, as an economist, Economist, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so uh, they call him doctor, but when people find out that he's, he's not a medical professional, they're like, what are you doing leading a nonprofit that's medical supplies all around the world? He said, Hey, I have the passion and I can connect people and I have all the right people in the right places. And now his son runs it and it's, it's incredible. But he helped me believe that like, Hey, I might quote unquote, just be a fighter in some of these people's eyes. And I don't have the education and I don't have the training yet, but I'll get it. And I'm just going to go for it. And it's been beautiful. And, and the hero of the story is not me. It's the people on the ground that are doing the work, like our well drilling team, our community development guys. They've taught me a Swahili proverb, and it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, if go you together. Wanna, yeah, if you want to go far, yeah. go together. I love that one. Uh, I love it, too. Yeah. And they live it. They breathe it. They, like, exemplify it. And then maybe to go on with this, like, if anyone's listening to this and they're thinking, well, I want to make a difference, but I think I'm... I'm too small or, or because when I went there, the problem was way too big. Kids were dying. I buried a young boy of waterborne disease. And that was my introduction to the water crisis. A one and a half year old boy named Andy Bow denied hospital treatment, not once, but twice just because of his tribe. It was discrimination. It was hatred. They told your mom, his mom, you're too dirty to come in here. They, when they raised the money, like begged for it because they'd never been paid in money because they had been enslaved a uh, hundred people or so. Um, bagged and they got three and a half dollars of Congolese franc. The one shot or the pills were $1. The one shot was $3. It's too late in the game for the pills. So he needed the shot. They had more than enough in money. They brought a chicken. They brought like a dozen or two dozen eggs. They brought uh, charcoal. They brought firewood. They laid it on the footsteps of the clinic and said, please. And the doctor finally came out. The nurse was the one that said, you're too dirty. Come in here. The doctor finally came out and said, we won't waste our medicine on a pygmy animal. And turned him away. And so, and then I held him as he died with his mom. Like, I mean, he was on the ground and I was cupping the back of his head. I was holding his little hand. His mother's hand was under my hand and she was holding his other hand. And like blood came out of his ears and under my hands. And his name was Andy Bo. And I was just like, fuck man, like this this happens. And I, I, I was, I was blown away and I had a conversation or I asked a question to a slave master. I go, why, 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 like, why, why wouldn't they give him treatment? And why wouldn't you help him if, if he's, cause this same guy said, what are you here doing with my property? I own these people. And I was like, fuck, what is going on in the world? Like I had no idea I was blinded to all this. And He said, it's cheaper to bury him than to keep him alive. And I was like, what? And so I had another conversation with him. When I went back, um, went to the market, came back with a casket that cost $30, a shovel that was like $6. And I just showed him the, the, the shovel. I was like, this is more expensive than the medicine. Like, there's no way that it was just cheaper to bury him than to keep him alive, you know? And so... Um, and it, I mean, anyways, it, it, that, that was where it started where I was like, dude, I'm, I'm all in. I'm I think it would in. shock a lot of people in this, it, you know, especially in, um, in America to know that there's still slavery going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I guess I've heard that before, but yeah. like, this is kind of the first time that's really sunk in for me. Like I've never yeah. heard of someone who's actually, or I've, I don't know anyone who's actually like seen it. Like, mm-hmm. You know, I've seen a lot of it. We clearly have our own problems in this country, but like, there's literally slavery going on in, in other areas, all over, areas the, all the, over world. the world. And um, there's more slaves today than ever in human history, ever. Wow, that's wild. Yeah, by like tens of millions. Um, I think the low estimate that's, is 40, oh that's 40, 40 million slaves or something like that. And there's never, I think, hundreds of years. I mean, I think I think in the U.S. at a time the the most slaves we had was like one or five million, you know, um, something like that. I might be slaughtering that quote, but yeah, there's more slaves today alive than ever in human history. And yes, there's more people, but it's like, it's, it hasn't, it hasn't decreased. It has increased. Also like any is too many. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any is like, exactly. any is too many, but I, too many. We're, we're just blinded to this yeah. stuff in the States. Yeah. Like, we just I, don't hear about this. I've seen people in literal chains. I've seen people in ropes. I've seen people forced down into gold mines, diamond mines, coal tan mines um, at gunpoint. I've seen children pulled out of mines that were dead from collapse. Um, yeah, I've, I, it's it's been... I mean, that's brutal. Coltan is in all our smartphones, smart devices. I think they're trying to manipulate the numbers now, but um, at one point, a few a few years ago when I lived there, 85%, at least 85% of the world's coltan came from Congo. 100% of that was slave mined. So if you think about it, more than eight out of 10 of our phones was because of slavery. You know, coltan conducts, I believe it conducts electricity at the highest rate of speed with staying cool so that it doesn't overheat. Um, and, and you know, something, something crazy happened recently. There's, there's two things. I'll get to my phone, but uh, to try to cue that up or remember it. I've, I get hit in the head for a living, so I forget. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, it's all good. <laughs> but the Swahili, other Swahili proverb is, they said, excuse me, if the, the uh, listeners heard me burp a little. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> good. The, uh, the Swahili proverb is, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try to sleep in a closed room with a mosquito. Ooh, yeah. And that is so true, because if a mosquito was in here, it would probably be bothering all three of us, right? It drives like, me insane. Yeah. yeah. Um, for me, they love me some reason. Like, uh, if, if there's 10, nine are going to land on me. One's going to fight, fight it out <laughs> yeah. for you. But uh, I have also had malaria three times, and it's because I'm allergic to the prophylaxis or the preventative pills. And I throw up when I take the pills. And so a doctor on the board of tropical medicine just said, hey, just get it. If you don't die from it the first time, you'll be more resilient. And, uh, and you know, it'll, it'll suck the first time, but then you plan on going here your whole life, so just get it. So I did. It almost killed me. I lost 33 pounds in five days. Wow. Um, <laughs> And I was vomiting red and green, which was blood and bile. I had something called black water fever. Um, Y'all's black shirt's darker than my black shirt. Uh, The black water fever, um, my urine was your color. Oh, my God. Because I couldn't urinate for five full days. And then whenever I finally was able to pee, it was black and it was sticky and it was darker than motor oil or or coffee or Coca-Cola, like darker than all that. Um, it was like pitch black liquid. It was like crazy, it looked like black paint or something. Yeah, um, that's freaky. Yeah. And so it was all the parasites or the dead red blood cells that the parasites were like basically shitting out, um, in my bloodstream and stuff like 70% of my 65 to 70% of my bloodstream was parasites oh. and yeah, yeah, brutal. And so the reason wow. I, I even say that is because that makes for me, and for the people that taught me this proverb, it's like, it, it's not just about a mosquito in a room that like bothers you, like, and it makes a difference. It's like also those little mosquitoes that weigh less than a gram, right? Yeah. Like I, I have fought guys six foot 10, 265 pounds. And, um, they didn't beat me up like a, like a little bitty mosquito did, right? Like that thing almost, yeah. it kicked my ass. Took, almost took my name right and uh almost took my life and so if a mosquito can have that big of a difference in one person's life or millions of people's lives it's like how much more of a difference can like you make or you yeah, make yeah. or me or like when we collectively come together it's like we have a lot more um going for us power like ability to like change lives to make this world better and so um yeah, and I, th- I think this might be a weird transition, but um, Amy and I, I told y'all how I went to treatment uh, twice uh, for addiction and that it really it changed my life. It helped me. But there was, there was a, you know, it's, it feels a little shameful just to bring up, but it was, I don't feel like I'm myself whenever I use. Of course, that's an excuse, but I just feel like when I'm not using, I'm a compassionate dude that really has my head on straight when I use, I just, I'm a shell of myself. I don't like me. I don't think others like me really either. And, um, and that's okay. Cause, cause I, um, I, I lose all that compassion. I lose, um, the ability to love people 
and uh, or love myself. And so there was a couple mistakes I made on my phone. I was using it to meet up with drug dealers and other stuff. And um, anyways, with Amy, who I love so much, and she's been able to forgive me in such a radical way that like has really demonstrated like, whoa, like people are more capable of um, a forgiveness, love, and and just even grace than, than I knew possible. But anyways, I, I made some mistakes, had some online conversations and some other stuff on this phone. And when I got out of treatment, she had found all that out. And we had talked about it while I was there. And um, so anyways, like I, I kind of hated myself for that for a moment and, and different things. But then we knew this is what what we want each other. And she wanted a was not going to settle for a guy that wasn't sober, Justin. She's like, I will be with sober Justin for the rest of my life, but I won't be with the guy that, that goes and uses and, and things like that. And so um, anyways, I took, I took my phone and Amy and I wanted to have something. There's things called despacho ceremonies. And there's so many, there's so many cultures that have rites of passage for, for boys going into manhood or young girls going into womanhood. But there's also like release Things where they'll have like fires and release something to their ancestors or the spirits or just like an offering and, and things. And so I came out of there and I, I was like, you know what? I think, I think, uh, and Amy had, had the idea, but I was already thinking about how could I destroy this fucking phone that I, uh, that I don't want anymore. This one at least. Um, and she's like, let's have like a phone smashing ceremony. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, dope. That sounds great. Let's do this. So we talked about setting it on fire or, or what and other things. And then we just decided to smash it. And we went down, we had intentions, we had, it was an incredible moment of us being real, her having some emotions, needing to share some things, me having emotions, needing to share some things, but then like just love, fun, good conversation, hugs, uh, songs that, that were meaningful to her and me and to our relationship. And when we smashed this phone, I had a moment where I was just like, oh my gosh, smash the phone open. And I saw inside of it, um, Coltan, which I hadn't seen refined and put into our phones before, but I knew what it was when I saw it. And I just had this moment where I broke. I'm like, holy smokes. Like on one end, my life is dedicated, um, to helping people find freedom that have been enslaved to this exact mineral. People have come and put this raw material in my hands thinking that it was going to change my life or change their life by them sneakily, like bringing it to me and putting it in my hands and me not even knowing what it was at first, but being like, what is this? And then they tell us, and then they tell us we're slaves for this. Like, this is what our whole life like revolves around is getting this material. What do you mean? What is it? You don't know. Like we're sending it you to you. You don't even know what it is. Yeah. And we, yeah. 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 And we're slaves for this. They thought it was like gold or diamonds, you know, like, and, and it is a precious material, but I was like, whoa. Then I had this moment. I'm, I don't know that I've ever shared this story, but um, hopefully it makes sense where I'm like, oh shit. Now I, they've been enslaved to this. And now I've been a slave to this fucking phone. Right. I've been a slave to this shit to, to whether it's social media or, um, validation or, or using it to get my fix. And that was the main thing was, was when I used, I, I went to that to, to be sneaky about my usage and how I could pick it up or where I could go or where I could get it and different stuff like that. And so that was a moment for me, probably 220 days ago. That was like, fuck, I'm getting, I'm getting rid of this. This isn't how I'm going to interact with this thing anymore. I'm not going to be a slave to this um, because there's so many people that I know love that have been, or still are um, enslaved because of this material, you know? So I, I don't know where I was going with that exactly, but um, it was definitely a learning moment for me where I was like just trying to open my eyes to more of, you know, what what do we give our time to and what do we what do we use as distractions and, you know, to that, that literally keep us from being the people that, that we could or should be. I think that's a tough thing to become aware of is what in my life is not really serving me because we just get so used to 
doing the same things over and over again. You don't realize, you know, I'll pick up my phone and all of a sudden I've been scrolling on Instagram or something for like five, 10 minutes. And I know that's not helping me be aware and present and with the people that I'm with. And it's just so just intuitive. So becoming aware of that, it's a really challenging thing, but for you, it like had this complete eye opening experience of, you know, the people that you're trying to help and related it back to the things that you're struggling with. Yeah. That's a, that's an interesting connection that you were able to make. Never would have made it if you didn't smash your phone. Yeah. 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 Right? <laughs> Never would have made it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm glad I did. Um, you know, there was moments of like guilt and shame. It's like, Hey, I have so much, uh, so many reasons to be grateful, so much purpose. And, and, um, and I, I hadn't had that before. And so honestly, um, hopefully when people hear me share this story, like I, I want it to be really shine through or at least say this is that they, they have helped me more than I could have ever helped them or will ever help them. I really believe that my first time going and meeting them, hearing their story, them asking like, can you help us have a voice? We don't have one because I, I, I didn't think I could do land, water, food, any of that, that they were asking for. I was like, I can't promise that. I can't say I can help with that. I don't know how to do that. And they said, can you help us have a voice? We don't have one. It was like, there was something that sparked that I was like, oh, you know, I live in the United States. We have free speech. Anybody can give someone a voice. Um, but I also have some sort of platform that I can use and get on some of the big podcasts or other things and like tell their story. And I was like, yes, I can do that. I think that they saved my life. Um, and so I'm, I'm forever indebted to that. But it's just crazy how if you fall back into those old ways or old patterns, like how fast it can sneak up on you or whatever it is, if you're not truly having self-awareness, staying grounded, like practicing some, some real things that uh, if you, if you ignore it, neglect it, um, it'll sneak up to you and you'll be almost right back where, where you were before. But then again, my, I, I don't know if I told Joe this, but Dr. Amen, uh, told me, he's like, you're not where you were three years ago when I met you. Like this last time I relapsed, he's like, cause I felt like I was, mm -hmm. I felt like I was worse than ever. Um, or at least I thought that for a moment. He's like, no, 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 Justin, like progress isn't linear. You don't yeah. just, you don't just get there and it's not just a smooth sailing upward thing up a hill. He's like, this is a, you'll have mountaintop experiences, valley experiences, but he's like, dude, I knew you three years ago. You've been my patient this long. I love you. And you need to hear the truth. And it's that you are better than you were before. Mm -hmm. And the asking for help isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Absolutely. And uh, I was like, whoa. So that was just a good moment for me where I was like, Oh, I'm not all the way back where I was, even though at times I felt that yeah. I can trick myself into that. Yeah. It's like, it's like, we got to zoom out. It's like progress isn't that you never have lows. It's just that maybe the lows that you do have are less frequent or the bottom is higher than exactly. it was, or, or maybe you do go back down, but then your comeback brings you up higher than where you are. You know what I mean? Like if you look at like a graph of your progress, that's how I'm imagining it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like everybody, uh, you know, I've, yeah, I like mean, a, like a, like a graph that's trending upward and there's still peaks and there's still valleys, but it's mm -hmm. trending upward. So you might have a high peak and a low valley, but that low valley is still like yeah. miles above where you were before, just because you fell so far, it might feel like, Oh my God, I've fallen all the way back down. Maybe you fell a similar amount, but you started off way higher. Yeah. So I think that's like an important perspective to keep in mind. And you're noticing, we talked about this yesterday, like yeah. you're noticing all these things along the way and you start to pick up those signs of when you start to fall off a little bit sooner and maybe you can start catching those valleys a little bit sooner. But regardless, you're still trending in a positive direction. Just because you hit a valley doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're not going to turn it around. Behind every peak is another valley. Behind every valley is another peak. You're just always trending upward. Yeah. Yeah. And when you said that about the graph, that was actually... Uh, Dr. Amon stood up all of a sudden and he had this like, little <laughs> papers you can, you can yeah. flip backwards, you know, and he started drawing that exact graph and <laughs> saying things like that. That was like, whoa, yeah. Everything's like that. Like if you look at the stock market, mm. any, any, any sort of progress track is like that. Yeah. There's nothing that can just go up forever without going down. That's impossible. Mm. 
Yeah, and I, I got I had the opportunity to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and I did that with yeah, it was cool. And we raised money for clean water, and I did it with Water Boys so and sick. Fight for the Forgotten. Water Boys is ran by Chris Long, who uh, won the Super Bowl twice with the Patriots, and then the very next year with the Eagles. And he's a good friend, amazing dude. And we climbed that with some Super Bowl champs and uh, some military veterans. Um, and three of them were, were like amputees from like uh, wounds that they had in battle. And man, seeing those guys dig it out, but also just thinking like, hey, just focus on our, not our Sherpas, but our, our guides. Um uh, porters and and the guys leading the trip said, you know, you just got to look at one foot in front of the other. On summit day, dude, it, we started at midnight and we didn't finish until 8 p.m. And so we, you were constantly moving. And there was one moment where some of the guys got really discouraged. And luckily I was a little further back to where I didn't hear these, uh, I think they're Austrian, um, Austrian pe- group, like, I guess they were teasing and they didn't think that we, our guys would have believed it, but they basically said as they were coming down from the summit, they beat everyone up there. They said, Oh, the summit's right there. And they pointed at this, uh, this big sign that had all these flags on it. And so all of a sudden I see the group start just moving and, uh, <laughs> like rushing to that. And, and the guys, the guides are like, Hey, poli poli, which means slowly, slowly in Swahili. It's like, Hey, slow down, slow down. And these guys are huffing it, like thinking, Hey, there it is, you know? got there and it was a false summit false peak, summit. A oh, false no. peak. yeah it was it was a like some sort of monument or like uh something cool to to see there's some history about it i forget but and then so many people were like discouraged thinking oh man and they're like no we we still have this many hours at least like it is way over there i think in life sometimes you might um stop focusing on just putting one foot in front of the other and look at how far you've got to go or you think you've reached it and it's a false summit or you think you're up there and then you realize you're a little further down than you thought. And, um, no, it was just, it was just a good lesson of like, no, just, just focus on what I can do. What is inside? I heard someone say one time, like what's inside my hula hoop. They're basically like, I can't control anything outside mm-hmm. of, uh, outside of arm's length for me. And so I'm just going to focus on what I can do, who I can be right here. Instead of getting too far out there, too far ahead, you know, just focus right here in this little circle right around me. What's an arm's length? I like that. Yeah. I think that's another reminder of the importance of doing something that you like. Another very basic concept that's actually like a lot harder than it sounds. Um, But if you, I mean, if the actual work of what you do is something that you like or that inspires you at the very least, then it's a lot easier to kind of shift your mentality to like, I'm just going to put one foot in front of the other until I, until I die of old age. You know what I mean? Like when you're, you know, I think probably the majority of people in this country, they get jobs for money and stuff like that and they hate it, you know? Um, and if you do, and all the only th- reason you're doing what you're doing is just for the money, it's kind of hard to do that, to be like, mm-hmm. let me just enjoy the journey, you know? Yeah. So uh, drilling the wells, we've drilled over 80 wells, and I helped drill the first 13, and then I've helped several since then when I go back. But these guys, if I'm, if we talk about belts in jiu-jitsu, white, blue, purple, brown, black, you know, I may be a blue belt. From, from the experience of a year doing it. Yeah. But um, these guys are now brown belt, black belt, like expert level. And it's it's incredible to see. But it is the most backbreaking, hardest work that I could ever imagine. If we can't get a mechanized rig there, which we've only done probably 20 or 30 mechanized rig wells, it's ma- the manual drilling method, which means we're using augers and ch- single prong, triple prong chisels and rock breakers. And we are wrestling the earth with oh chains God. and ropes and, uh, and these galvanized steel pipes. And we are having to hike that in off the road because oftentimes in the rainforest or in the mountains uh, or a rainforest in the mountains, you can't drive these million dollar, half million dollar drilling rigs that you rent and that 
also can attract problems with like rebel groups in the area because is that to drill gold or that's an expensive machine and and it gets just beat up on those roads, right? And so the the to maintenance and keep those things, the upkeep, it's like don't own one of those things. <laughs> um, so we'll have to hike in one ton of well drilling equipment. Holy shit. 2,000 pounds plus, and it's 20 foot long pipes, uh, six meters. It's uh, bags of cement, which they only sell bags that are 100 pounds there, like nothing smaller than that. <laughs> you have to hike in bags of bricks of uh of gravel of stones and of sand and it is just the craziest hardest work but what's really cool is to see a group that uh, is dedicated to this work then the village having buy-in where they they take ownership of the project and say we're part of this we're going to help you guys walk all this stuff in so all of us like doing it together, having that like, what's that word, camaraderie or however you say it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then at the end of it, like during it, sometimes it's a week, two weeks, three weeks. One time it took 28 days, four weeks straight of drilling in one spot to get a well finally. Because we're oh, going wow. 60, 80, 150 feet deep just by wrestling the earth like six inches at a time, eight inches at a time. Um, but at the end of it, the celebration, like oh, I can't even imagine, dude. It is. I've been to the World Series. I've been to the NBA Finals, or I mean the Super Bowl, the in, um, and the NBA Finals. I mean the Manny Pacquiao fights, the Conor. I mean just whatever it is, UFC 100, 200. I've been to the biggest sporting events in the world. Arenas so big, and like a hundred people or a thousand people getting clean water for the first time drowns out every one of those arenas. Wow. And um, yes, by the the actual cheers, but more of like the heart behind it. It's not like, oh, someone won a game. Yes, my favorite team. It's like, holy shit, my kids are going to live now. Yeah. Um, I won't lose another child. That is or, I mean, struggle to strength. That is, I mean, yeah. you're never going to get a celebration like that from... Uh, Mm -hmm. having money handed to you by your parents or winning the lottery, even, you know, maybe you would, you maybe do have a reaction like that for, you know, one day winning, like if you, if you won, if you won money, but you're never going to have satisfaction like that, that you would, if you spent that much amount of time wrestling the earth to create water, to save people's lives in your community. Like that's, and that's why we use, uh, local people to be, the solution to their problem Mm -hmm. because there is a problem in the NGO world. And I think people are starting to try to shift it, but um, a lot of them, you know, just the bigger you get and the more money you have and the quotas you got. And, um, and it's been working for decades, quote unquote working, um, you know, that you think you, you know how it's supposed to go, but the traditional, nonprofit or NGO model humanitarian method is you show up, blow up and blow out of there. You announce your arrival with a parade, you throw a party, uh, you get a bunch of pictures and then you're on to the next one. And it's done by people from the West or no one that lives in that local community. And it's done with a million dollar drilling rig or half a million dollar drilling rig. It's too expensive for the locals to, to do for themselves, the maintenance, they're not taught how to do it. They're not equipped. Um, there's no locally affordable or locally available solutions if, if a well goes down. And so because of that, 230,000 wells in Africa right now are broken and, or just need a little maintenance and love. Mm -hmm. And no one's been empowered to do that, educated, how to do that, equipped, how to do that. And so that's billions of wasted charitable dollars. It's not sustainable. No. Yeah. No. So it has to be locally led and operated and motivated and, and, um, yeah. The, the more, the more we're talking about this, the more I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, process versus the end goal, kind of like what we were just talking about earlier. And, you know, it seems like a lot of these larger NGO organizations, um, they, they just get to the end goal. 
Like, you know, we're, we're going to build this many wells. We're going to build this, the biggest wells. We're going to help this many people. Whereas the sustainable route, the route that it seems like you're taking is like, I'm just going to get really good at helping people like by any means necessary. I don't know. You're like the sustainability component, getting really good at helping people, the process of helping people rather than just having that end goal, you're probably going to enjoy it a lot more too. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be more helpful and sustainable in the long run. Yeah. So it's, what's been really neat, um, lately is, and I kind of started leading into this and you brought it back to this, but project cure, they're the best in the game at what they do. And they do those feasibility studies and, uh, viability. I mean, the local needs assessments and, and all that stuff. And they won't do it unless it's locally ran and operated, which is the way to go. We also have the founder of Engineers Without Borders who teaches at University of Colorado. And he's created an opportunity for over 17,000 engineers to help the developing world because when he went to school and he's from France but lives in the US and uh, when he was in school, there was not one American university that taught engineering for developing nations at all. The only thing you could get a degree in is how to build a skyscraper, how to, how to build a... Um, a suburban neighborhood, how to build corporate offices. Um, and there was nothing to help the one or two or 3 billion people on the planet that are making a dollar a day that are just trying to survive today. There was, so the gap was just getting wider and wider and wider to where it's like, it's only engineering is only going to take care of the the richest 1% or five or 10% of people. And uh, so his mission was to start it so that people could go around and help people around the world to teach them locally, local sustainable options. So we have him, we have project cure, we have conscious coalition, which fight for the forgotten is community development in conscious coalitions, more human development, like leadership training, uh, women's equality, um, and all sorts of stuff where women's equality and empowerment, uh, stopping child abuse, um, and really just heart centered, uh, movement. So us all coming together has been really great because I noticed in the first couple of years of being a nonprofit, I was like, why, why are people so protective? Like they don't want to introduce you to anybody. They don't want to work with you. Like, it's like, yeah, you're, you're, it's you and you're doing that. But what are we doing? Is, yeah. Well, how, how do we do it together? Like, <laughs> like you're get better at that. I'm better at this or like, Maybe I'm not good at any of it, but let's let's go forward and figure out how we can help people in the, the most meaningful way. What's been neat about this project um, on the border of Congo in Uganda is we have a huge opportunity where there's four founders of nonprofits that are much further along than me saying that this could be an example to the world of what's possible. If we do this right over the next five years, potentially 10 years, we can open source these plans to where any nonprofit or any community or any local government or any, anybody can just do the same thing, which is literally land, water, food, medical, education. I mean, we're about to start our first ever reservoir. Um, and the founder of Engineers Web, uh, Bernard, is helping us design this. And a woman named Zoe it's like we've done we've done spring boxes, we've done water wells, we've done water towers, but now we're about to do like a, a reservoir for a municipality, a, a budding one that's just starting because they living in the mountains and we're able to drill wells for two or three of the communities, but there's so many communities that we just can't drill a well for. It's a mountainous region, can't get a truck there, can't manually drill it. They picked a place that's really hard to live, but it's working for them in one area and they just thought we'll never have clean water. It's like, so how do we get these people clean water? And the reservoir is going to serve 5,000 people immediately, but it can grow to 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people. And we, we're planning, now we're planning for expansion of like, we're not just serving these people, but we have a business marketplace coming there and a meeting grounds where they can sell their local uh, cultural goods, but also they're going to be raising goats maybe heifers or cows, uh, uh, bees for the pygmy people. They, the honey is, is, uh, uh, luxury for them. It's, um, and so it's, it's really cool to see all the things happening. Like it's, 
it's we don't just drill waters or we're not just building homes it's like it's what do you guys need okay we're listening to y'all we're listening we're listening we're finding these people that can do that we're finding these people that can do that we're finding these people that can do that and they're going to show you how to do it mm-hmm. so that way you can continue to do it like vocational training mm-hmm. i think this is how we as you know a world people are going to save the planet mm-hmm. is through yep. small like local um initiatives small as in you know i think a lot of people look to the government or like billionaires and and big corporations to kind of like those are those are the smart people that they know what they're doing you know they have all the money um and you know you look at things like um where there was that big hurricane in um the country in the caribbean can't remember what it's called right now but um, Haiti, Haiti, yeah. There's the big hurricane, hurricane in Haiti. or earthquake. Yeah, yeah, big, yeah. yeah, big, yeah. There was a big natural disaster yeah, in Haiti, yeah. um, and like FEMA came I went in there right after it. They spent yeah. like a billion dollars and built like a football stadium or something. I saw some like crazy documentary yeah. about that. And then there's was just all Tint these people City? like unhoused. I saw, I saw Tent City uh, with my eyes. It was before I ever went to Africa, um, and and it was wild, man. Like there was people that had it had a decent job for being in Haiti. Um, but they moved out or started renting their home and they moved out. They started renting their home to somebody else. They started living in the tent city because they got three meals a day. They had clean water um, and they were able to make money at work. They were able to, to rent out their place and they're able to live at tent city and start saving for this. And there was no motivation for them to do anything for themselves. It's like, Oh, all these people are coming in to do this for us. Yeah. And if it's not theirs to build back their country, um, that that's what I've really learned is from from getting on the same level, like eye to eye um, with people and not coming in saying, hey, here's the blueprint cookie cutter solution that is going to that works here and it's going to work for you. It's like, wait, this might be a different country or a different culture, a different community, a different tribe, a different language, or just like they could be speaking all that. But these people want this and these ones don't want that. And so you have to come in and say, what do you want? And they're like, hey, almost all of them. Like, I think every human at the core of the human heart, like you want to be, you, you want to provide for your children. You want to be part of the solution. You don't want to have to, um, for the most part, if there's not some sort of like trauma and mental illness or, or some sort of addiction, I think people want to help themselves um, and help the people around them. So they say, hey, we don't want to hand out. We want to hand up. Mm-hmm. And so we've always said as a, as a nonprofit, um, we're not a charity. Like we're not in the business of doing charity. We create opportunity. Like opportunity, charity can be great, but opportunity is always better. Mm-hmm. And so we're not going in to like give this out. Even whenever we drill a well, we're like, uh, hey, I'm, we're excited that, that you want clean water, but how are we going to do this? And they're like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, we need a local contribution. Like, can you raise a hundred dollars? I mean, the well costs like three, five, I mean, five, 10 grand sometimes. It's like, can these people that have never been paid in money in their lives, can they, can we help them and we'll help them get a job, but can then, can they raise a hundred, 200, $300 to just to show us they got skin in the game Mm. or can they, can they provide our, our lodging? Can they build us literal twig and leaf or mud huts while we come in to drill the wells and can they feed us while we're there? Like we're working, there's no restaurants out here. Like we haven't had a toilet. I, I didn't have a toilet for a year um, and no running water. And I mean, it was, it was, it was different, but it's like, while we're here, can you cook us corn and beans and uh, you know, as a, as a whole, a collective. And they want to do that. They're like, yeah, of course. <laughs> and so they're at they're, It's inviting them to get off the bench and into the game. And then from that, we have education of saying, hey, we need to start some sort of like council or board or treasury that like you put money aside every month. That's like an insurance policy of like, you know, they might have $100 sitting there to where if if something breaks or needs maintenance, they can call our team and they don't feel like they're saying, hey, this broke. We don't know how to do it. You got to come help us save us. It's like they call our team. They say, Hey, something's going on. We need you to come out and inspect it. We got some money. We're going to give it to you. Like, come, come help us. Or, or we train a local person that lives in that community. Be able to do it himself. That's awesome. 
So that way they're not ever thinking it's, you know, we can't do this for ourselves. Yeah. We're dependent on them. It's like, no, you guys, we, we all set this up to where whenever this is a service we're providing and whenever, whenever things happen, which all our wells are functioning, but if something, you know, needs a new coupling or coupler, or a new nut and bolt, it's like, just get out there, do it real quick. And then they feel like, you know, is that, that energy exchange of not them being dependent on us. Yeah. It's like the difference between if something in your house breaks, calling your handyman versus like, you know, asking your dad or a friend if they can come help. Cause you don't know how to do it. Yeah. You just feel more empowered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, I think that's an important part of what you're doing is like, you're empowering people. You're not just giving them stuff. Yeah. You're empowering them. Though. You're educating them. You're creating a sustainable environment and like a community that functions yeah. very well. It, I think the opportunity is that we, we get to create an opportunity for them to find and have and establish and grow in dignity. Mm-hmm. Um, like that self-sufficiency. And I think a lot of times the normal charitable model has like crippled communities uh, by giving too many handouts. They'll come in and give out, you know, a whole container of shoes. And now the local market guy, like everybody gets two or three pairs of shoes. The local person selling shoes, it's living paycheck to paycheck or day by day and trying to pay school fees or buy food, stuff like that. He's wiped out of business where the, the cobbler that repairs mm. the shoes, he's out of business. Like it just yeah. push. I've seen people literally move because nonprofits from the West just come in, crack open a container and give all this stuff away. And you know, there's the NBA final shirts that like the mm-hmm. uh, one year it was like the Miami heat one. And it was like, no, no, they didn't like people are like, Hey, the heat, and they're showing yeah. me their shirts. And I'm like, they actually lost. They're like yeah. it says they won. <laughs> you know? And it's a nice thing to do, but it, it, there has to be a process where, um, you know, I want people to get things and be provided for, but not at the expense of like the local business owner that, mm-hmm. that like they do this day in and day out. This is how they provide for themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This has, this has been amazing, man. I mean, you're, we went from, you're an extremely well-rounded human to now you have a very well-rounded approach hmm. to, to helping humans. And hey, so, thanks. yeah, the connection, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's vibrating. It's frequency is, hmm. is vibrating out into the world and there's a ripple effect there. So I think it's amazing. Uh, everything that you've done, man, it, it's really great. Thank you. Really I think, great. uh, two things I could leave people with is, um, they could check out our show together with, with you two. Definitely. Um, that, was, that. that was awesome. It's on, uh, overcome with Justin Wren, Spotify, YouTube, Apple, all the, all the platforms. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at the big pygmy. Uh, you can support fight for the forgotten. Um, and really it's as easy as, uh, you know, join our monthly giving club. It's, it's called fight club. And, um, and you can give $5 a month or more. And, uh, and that really helps us build a network and army of support. That's like, this is our tribe that we know, you know, our budget, what we can do, how we can do it. And we're growing that so we can grow our impact. Um, and we have a, a docu-series that's going to come out. Uh, it's called Overcomer. It's five or six episodes. Uh, we already have the first one, not out, but it's, we had a screening here at Soho House. And I'm really excited, man. It's going to cover uh, uh, bullying, suicide, addiction, modern day slavery, the water crisis, and my comeback to fighting. And so, uh, it's, it's neat. Wow. It's, um, yeah, but I'm just really grateful that I was able to be here with you guys. Um, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, man. We're, Excited we're, we're just as grateful as well. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming here. Um, and to all the listeners, I mean, you know, definitely go give Justin a follow, uh, phenomenal. Like I said, very well-rounded human being. And for only $5 a month, I mean, you, you certainly have my support. Yeah. We'll for be sure. Struggle to strength <laughs> will be, yeah. Uh, struggle donated. strength will for Thank sure you. be a, a continued supporter as will my business. And, um, I think a lot of the listeners will probably really enjoy this episode and tune in as well. So wow. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, man. So thank you again for coming on. Thank you to everybody who's tuned in to another episode of the Struggle to Strength podcast. We'll see y'all next week. Yeah.